Welcome back students. In this video, we're going to look at an addition reaction called hydrohalogenation. Let's start by looking at the general reaction for hydrohalogenation. What's happening in this reaction is you're starting with an alkene and you're adding something like HBr. When you add something like HBr at low temperature, what occurs is a hydrogen adds to one side and the halogen adds to the other side. You're going to see a lot of HBr used for these reactions because HF is too reactive and HI is too slow. So HBr is like our sweet spot and then HCl is also sometimes used. We're going to also see some people write low temperature here because the low temperature is needed to make sure that the delta G is as negative as possible, which is going to push the formation of the most amount of products. Next, we're going to look at regiochemistry, stereochemistry, and the fact that there's a carbocation in this reaction. What if we had an asymmetrical alkene? In the example I showed you on the previous page, you had a symmetrical alkene, so it didn't matter where you put the bromine. But now it's going to matter. Where is the halogen going to go? So let's go through and write our products as our two potential products. One of them isn't going to form, but we'll get to that. What's going to happen in your addition reactions is you're going to focus on the carbons that are sp2 hybridized, and your groups are going to add to each of those carbons. So you're going to have, say, a hydrogen that adds here, and then your bromine could add here. And the other potential location that your bromide could go is your bromide could go here, whereas your hydrogen could go here. Now only one of these is going to form in this reaction, so how do we know where that halogen is going to add? This is called a Makarovnikov addition. It's called a Makarovnikov addition because some guy named Makarovnikov recognized that there's a pattern where the nucleophile often adds to the more substituted position. For us, that means of these two products, this is going to be the one that forms. This is your Makarovnikov product where the bromine is at the more substituted position. Where the bromine adds to the less substituted position is not going to form. And this it would be called the anti-Makarovnikov product. Okay, but what if you wanted the bromine to go to the less substituted position, what would you do? Well, you can actually force it, and we're not going to look at the mechanism for this until we talk about radicals, but if we added peroxide to our solution, then what will happen is we will get bromine added to the less substituted side, and we call that the anti-Makarovnikov addition, and this is the anti-Makarovnikov product. There's a couple of ways to write peroxide. Some people will write the word peroxide. Other people will use our favorite and most commonly known peroxide, which is hydrogen peroxide. And some people will write R2O2 because it really doesn't matter if the uh, peroxide has hydrogens on either side or if it has some kind of alkyl group. The key is when you're looking at peroxides, they need to have that oxygen-oxygen bond. Right, so this oxygen-oxygen bond is what makes it a peroxide. Let's go back to the Makarovnikov addition. I want to look at the mechanism, which is including those curved arrows to illustrate why you get Makarovnikov addition. What happens in this mechanism is your pi bond acts as a base, and it abstracts this proton, and these electrons need to go onto the bromine. When this happens, you have two options as to where the hydrogen is going to add. I'm going to draw both so that you can see what those two options look like. Your hydrogen could add here, and if it does, you would get a positive formal charge on the other side. Because remember, you're leaving a hole there. You had four bonds, and now you don't. Now you only have three. The other thing that could occur is if the hydrogen added to this side, then you'd have a positive formal charge on the other side of where your alkene used to be. 
Now we need to pause and think about our background knowledge. Which one of these is going to form? Think about our carbocations. When we looked at carbocations, we said tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations. What that means for us is this first carbocation that we drew is going to form because that one is tertiary. Whereas the second one is secondary, it's not as stable. So in order for that to form, you'd have to overcome a higher energy of activation, and that's just not going to be uh, realistic. Now that we know that the positive charge, the carbocation, is at the more substituted position, remember that you also have bromide ion running around in solution because your bromide was from the HBr. Your bromide is going to behave as the nucleophile. It's going to come in and it's going to attack the carbon of the carbocation and you end up getting a product where your bromine has added to the more substituted side. Now, I didn't draw the H in over here, but I can. You just want to be careful because if you're using an online homework system, you don't want to put in random H's because your online homework system is going to get confused. The computer will get confused and think that you mean something that you don't. So you have to really make sure that you are communicating well. And you also want to maybe just use that as a stepping stone of, I know where the hydrogen is, I can draw it in, but when I get to the test, I don't need to draw in the hydrogen um, because that's not correct skeletal notation either. Now let's talk stereochemistry. In that middle of the reaction, you formed a carbocation intermediate. Here I have a picture of just a general, you know, carbocation where it doesn't matter what groups I have attached here, here, and here. What matters is that the carbon in the middle that I'm highlighting in yellow only has three bonds. And when it only has three bonds, what that means for us is that this is a positive formal charge and that there's an empty p orbital there. When you have that empty p orbital, you have an sp2 hybridized carbon, which is trigonal planar. With that empty p orbital, your nucleophile is perfectly capable of adding from this side of the p orbital, and it's also capable of adding from this side of the p orbital. Because you get equal possibility of attack from both sides of the p orbital, this means that if you have a chiral center at the end of your reaction, you're going to end up with both enantiomers. Right, so if your final product is chiral, you're expecting a set of enantiomers. And that's really important because you are going to be expected to write stereochemistry on your exams. So let's go ahead and say, right, if the product has a chiral center you're going to get both enantiomers let's talk some more about that carbocation not only is that carbocation going to cause our stereochemistry, but also we have to be aware that whenever we have a carbocation in a mechanism, we need to watch out for carbocation rearrangements. What I mean by that is when we start this mechanism here and we have our pi bond attack that hydrogen and then this bond breaks, what will happen is we need to look at where the positive charge can be. The positive charge could be here or it could be here. Well, you know primary carbocations don't form, so don't even think about that. So we're going to get our positive charge here because our hydrogen is adding here. Now, if we look at this, this is a secondary carbocation. But can we anticipate a way to make this tertiary? Now, I say anticipate because you aren't actually doing anything to make it tertiary. That carbocation, it already can see into the future. It knows that there is a better pathway that leads to a lower energy, and it's just going to roll down that, that lower energy pathway. So what that means is it's going to rearrange. You can't stop it. It's just we're trying to predict it on paper. So what we'll do is we'll have a hydrogen 
on the other side, right, I'm not going to use the one in green because that would make a primary carbocation, which is less stable. But the one that I've drawn in purple is going to be a, is a tertiary hydrogen. And if this does that hydride shift, then what will happen is now your hydrogen will end up here and your carbocation will be in the location that your purple hydrogen used to be. Now that we've drawn this rearranged carbocation, let's go ahead and remember that we still have chloride ion running around in solution. So the chloride is going to attack the carbon that bears the positive charge, and we get this as our major product. So this is major. That being said, Carbocation rearrangements do happen really quickly, but it is possible that the chloride ion could attack before the rearrangement could occur. What that means for us is we have another potential product at the end coming from the chlorine attacking the secondary carbocation before it had an opportunity to rearrange. If that happened, your chlorine would be here. This would be your minor product and we can practice some stereochemistry here. Do you see where the chlorine is attached? How that is a chiral center? So really, you should have a pair of enantiomers. What I like to do is just cheat a little bit and turn that line into a filled in wedge, and then I can draw my dashed bond. So why am I not putting wedges and dashes on my major product? Well, I mean, I could, but it's not chiral because the location where the chlorine is attached has two methyl groups. So I don't really need to add those because there's no stereochemistry there that we need to consider. Let's wrap up. In this video, we looked at hydrohalogenation where you add a hydrogen and a halogen across the pi bond. We said that this is a Makarovnikov addition, except if you added peroxide, and then you'd get that anti-Makarovnikov addition. Because this reaction requires the formation of a carbocation, you have to be aware that the more stable carbocation is the one that's going to form, which is what dictates that Makarovnikov product. Because you have a carbocation forming, you need to be aware that you are looking out for carbocation rearrangements, and because of the way the carbocation is set up, you can get a pair of enantiomers if there's a chiral center at the end of your molecule. Thanks so much for watching. This is Katoni signing out.